Aloha, this is Roger Brewer with the Hawaii Department of Health. This is a recording of a presentation I originally gave to the U.S. EPA Engineering Forum Incremental Subsampling Committee on November 17, 2021, titled Investigations of Contaminated Water, More Than Just Putting Water in a Jar. This presentation is very similar to the one I gave at that time. I've added a few notes on some of the questions that came up at the end of that presentation. I like this quote by Albert Einstein, if I were given one hour to save the world, I would spend 59 minutes defining the problem and one minute solving it. That's really what I want to do today, just think more about the problem with the way we collect groundwater samples and water samples in general currently, and what the potential error is in the data that we have. And if there are ways that we might be able to improve the way we collect samples and improve uh, the way we make decisions. I like this that someone gave me a few weeks ago, the science lining curve. It really well describes how the environmental industry has evolved over the last several decades. So on the left, basically we started initially with addressing potential error in soil and sediment samples. So perhaps in the 1980s, we thought we knew everything. And we started knowing in the early 1990s, there's probably more to this than I thought. And at some point, when you start thinking about G's theory of sampling and all the potential error and discrete soil samples and sediment samples, and you really wonder if you're ever going to understand it. A little bit of training, a little bit of field experience starts to make sense. And during that time, we more or less just kicked the can down the road in the 1990s, early 2000s, before we actually started to make changes. I think now we understand how to collect samples of particulate matter like soil and sediment. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. So we've put this off for a while, but we finally forced ourselves here in Hawaii to go back and think more about the way we collect groundwater samples. Do we have the same problem? Do we really think we know everything? And maybe there's more to it than that. Another good quote for this particular topic, the aim of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set a limit on infinite error. How much error is in our data? How much contamination are we potentially missing and posing an unobserved risk to human health and the environment? Or are we forcing represent responsible parties to do more cleanup than they really need to in harming the economic status of our community? A primary reference going over is the, our technical guidance manual published by the Office of Hazard Evaluation, the Emergency Response, where I work with the Hawaii Department of Health. Sections three through five of that document discuss sampling theory in general especially with a focus on soil and sediment. A lot of details on how to collect representative soil and sediment samples in the field and process them and test them at the laboratory. Section 7 addresses indoor air and soil vapor sampling, which we've also done some field research and thought more about we'll to be talking about that a little bit during this presentation on ways to collect more representative soil vapor samples. Indoor air folks have been doing it correctly pretty much all the time. Section 6 was our discussion of groundwater and surface water sampling, which we've put off for a while revising this section. But the same concepts apply. We need to revise the section to incorporate just the basic com concepts of systematic planning, like decision units, and think more about the reliability of what I refer to as these single increment water samples, the water samples collected from a single monitoring well with respect to decision making overall. Some good references just to think about collecting samples of anything by the Association of American Feed Control Officials. The first one's good samples, guidance on obtaining defensible samples, and then good test portions, guidance on obtaining defensible test portions at the laboratory. So one is for the field, one is for the laboratory. It's, it's published by the American Feed Control Officials because people that produce the feed for livestock have to be very careful about potential contaminants in the livestock. They have a, a lot of risks they need to address. And we have a lot of recorded webinars on these topics. This presentation will be added to our webinars on YouTube. And you can see the web page below. So quick terminology for those who are familiar with our work, other people's work on soil sampling and sediment sample. First is the concept of a decision unit. The decision unit is an area or volume of soil or any other media you would collect and test as a single mass or single volume if you could and send it to the laboratory. It's a good way to think about it. We'll look at more of that in more detail. Uh, a discrete sample is different from a discrete decision. A discrete decision is just a, a discrete area of a site you want to test. A discrete sample, different topic. And in this sense for soil, it, 
it means collecting a, a random handful of dirt essentially from one point within your targeted area. We're talking about soil or sediment, putting it in a jar, send it to the laboratory. The laboratory opens the jar, maybe tries to mix it, but as the laboratory chemist told me once, they were trying mixing soil in a jar with a metal rod. It doesn't really work. And they collect a discrete subsample and test it. So that's a discrete sample. Multi increment sample is the term we use in our office is you still have the same decision unit area, same targeted area you want to characterize. But in this case, the sample is collected from multiple points within that area. Each point, the soil you collect is called an increment. So you collect 30, 40, 50 grams of soil from 50 points, combine it all into one sample. That's a multi-increment sample. So we're going to be thinking about these same issues with for water, groundwater and surface water. Application of sampling theory to environmental investigations, it may seem complicated at first, but in reality, we've been doing it for quite a while. We just haven't been collecting soil sam pro the samples properly, I think. The two things that Chuck Ramsey, who's probably one of the best sampling statisticians that I know of in the world anyway, likes to emphasize that the two objectives of any investigation for environmental work either is to assess risk or to optimize remediation. It's two points you need to keep in mind when you're collecting samples of anything or an environmental investigation. The theory of sampling, if you read, attempt to read G's theory of sampling by Francis Batar, a lot, very complicated, a lot of statistics, a lot of details, but it can be boiled down to, to four relatively simple steps. So step one is what's the question? What do you want to know? Step two, what's the decision? Unit? Step three, how can a representative sample be collected from that decision? Unit? And step four, how will the data be used to make decisions. A great quote, quote from Chuck from one of his classes, it's what you left in the ground that's most important, not what you put in the jar. So think about that. The data you get back from a laboratory directly represent media that are no longer at the site that you were concerned about in the first place. So you have to make inferences that those data for the sample you collected are actually representative of what you left behind in the field. So that's a big step. It requires a lot of assumptions, a lot of details. This is a quick way to explain the theory of sampling. We'll do it with fish this time. So the, the, the question might be, does PFOS, uh, the perfluoroalkyl substances in fish, pose a chronic health risk say for if you eat them for a long time, many years, six to 24 years, depending on whether you're looking at non-cancer risk for children, cancer risk for adults. But this is the investigation question. So every investigation, every time you go out in the field, you should have a specific question in mind. Well, which fish? So maybe these fish, you see the fish I have here highlighted by this red box. Now you've defined your decision much more specifically to a specific type of fish, specific group population of media. You can refine this further, your decision unit. So you do want to test the whole fish? Well, no, we're just worried about the fillets in this example. So that's our decision unit. The next step would be how to collect a sample. So would you collect and individually test 10 fillets of 10 different fish and guesstimate a mean? Well, no, that's not a risk-based approach to test. The data for any one fillet doesn't address the question being asked. A much better way, more efficient way to, to collect a sample would be to collect a single multi-increment sample where you collect small increments of fillet from multiple fish, combine it into one sample and test it. And then do that two more times to test the overall sampling method precision. And then there's always a decision statement that you want to have prepared before you go out and collect samples so you know what you're going to do with the data. So maybe in this case, the decision statement is to ban fish from the market if the mean concentration of PFOS exceeds X. So not that complicated on the big scale. So there were a lot of red flags when we started thinking about groundwater. We've been thinking about this for years. We've just been putting it off and focusing on soil and soil and sediment and soil vapor for the last several years. So a lot of red flags in groundwater sample data represent, and it's very similar to soil. One of the red flags that pops up immediately for us is the tiny soil volume, tiny sample volumes that we're sending to the laboratory. And how much water should you collect at a site? Well, it's the volume required by the lab for testing. So the same issue that we were dealing with in soil, there's not really any science behind that. Another problem is the assumed small scale uniformity of, of contaminant concentrations. And we'll 
that again in more detail in a minute in the groundwater itself just focusing on groundwater for a minute but we know that the contaminant distribution in soil can be extremely heterogeneous at the, the scale of the subsample that tested actually tested by the laboratory this is due to differences in sorption to soil particles diffusion into clay particles and such so if we have a lot of, of distributional as we call it heterogeneity of the contaminant in the soil and think of this for pce even in a groundwater plume most of the pce is going to be absorbed to soil particles if it's any clay or carbon organic carbon in the soil not necessarily in the groundwater around those particles so if there's a lot of distributional heterogeneity of pce or any other contaminant in the soil we would expect a lot of small scale distributional heterogeneity within the groundwater also so that throws up a red flag also the lack of replicate sample data or maybe at least co-located sample data for say monitoring wells if we move our monitoring well over a few meters are we going to get the same concentration or just how much how different might it be how much error is there in assuming the concentration of a contaminant in groundwater at a single point and then a big red flag also for those of us who might be visually minded are these isolated hot spots and cold spots which are always confusing with these both seemingly extremely detailed iso concentration maps that some of the computer programs uh, generate and we know from soil studies now that when you see isolated hot spots and cold spots like you see in this, this is a map of nitrate contamination in groundwater we'll look at it again later then a lot of times these are just artif artifacts of of a small scale heterogeneity so if you were to collect a, a sample from a well a few feet away or a few meters away or something you may get a totally different number so we'll look at that again in more detail so what it comes down to is we really don't know the scale of error in our groundwater data maybe it's not that much in some cases like we see for soil and maybe it's really bad in other cases like we see for soil and sediment also just something we need to think about more a lot of commonality between in the guidance written in the 1980s and 1990s for testing soil and testing groundwater and one is this concept really an assumption of uniform uniformity in plumes either in the soil or in the groundwater and the search for these hot spots so on the left is a quote from epa's 1989 guidance methods for the evaluating the attainment of cleanup standards for soil and when there is little distance between points it is expected that there will be little variability between points so the spacing of discrete soil samples from this guidance really what a lot of people are still using today for discrete sampling is the idea of catching these kind of large-scale hot spots well we know now that that's incorrect that you can collect two samples a few inches away from each other and they could have orders of magnitude different in concentrations even within the same sample itself so that was a big problem that caused a lot of error a lot of headaches in, in the soil and sediment world but the same concepts were being thought of in groundwater so here's a quote from 1996 low flow groundwater sampling procedures samples taken in close proximity for example within a few meters are highly autocorrelated the dense spatial monitoring runs the risk of redundant data well there are no supporting field studies quoted at least in this guidance document to support this this idea it was just it was an idea maybe there's some studies we haven't seen them so the spacing of, of monitoring wells again was done in the same way for soils just to try to catch these large scale and hopefully uniform plumes of contamination how realistic is that let's think about that let's start back at the beginning the best way and again this these are debates we're having within our group and with consultants here in hawaii and on the mainland and other regulators so the best way to start thinking about a problem is start back at the beginning so first i want to go over the theory of sampling is applied to indoor air soil and sediment and subslab soil vapor which we've been looking at for for 10 or 15 years now then we we'll look at the theory of sampling applied to surface water and groundwater and get back to the basics and always the place to start at any investigation what's the question what's your decision every time you collect a sample it has to be a tied to a specific mass or volume area of whatever population you're trying to study and then how can a representative sample be collected from that decision i want to uh, we'll progressively work through more complex samples just to work through this issue and help us think about it so first we'll look at a, 
collecting samples of water from a water tank, and then bottled water, and then an open swimming pool, and a sand-filled swimming pool, and then a layered dirt-filled swimming pool. And then we look at a dry cleaner test case to kind of do a reality check on all these ideas. So first, let's look at testing of indoor air, which has mostly been well done in the past. Perhaps in, in one point because it's easier to do, it's just easier to think about. So here's the question, and you'll notice the question in all these examples I've given is pretty much the same thing. All I did was change the media. So does contaminant X in indoor air pose a chronic health risk? And right now we're looking at long-term chronic health risk exposure over many years. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna add a few thoughts about testing for acute risk. So here, that's the question the risk assessor might ask. When the field, what are the data needs? With a person in the field, you're, you're tasked with determining what, what is the mean concentration of X in indoor air during the specified exposure period. So the decision unit is the volume of air circulating within the structure during the specified exposure period. So for vapor intrusion risk, we assume a default single family home volume is one example of 244 cubic meters. So the required indoor air exchange rate for single family homes in a permit and construction and such is 0.35 times per hour. So it's pretty easy to calculate over 24 hours how much air in theory is circulating through that house. In this case, it's over 2 million liters a day. Well, that's a lot of air. And it's not realistic to send a beach ball this size, see it's three times the size of your house to a laboratory for testing. So how do you collect a sample of this? Well, a not risk-based way to collect a sample would be to go inside the house and collect and individually test 10 instantaneously collected random, say one liter samples of air from around the house and calculate a mean. Maybe you get a reasonable answer, maybe you don't, you wouldn't really know. A better way to do it, which is the way anyone doing indoor air testing would do, is to collect a single continuous sample of circulating air during the targeted exposure time. So in this case, you see on the bottom left, maybe you put a suma canister in one of the rooms, maybe a couple of the rooms just to check the precision of your data. Open it up and let it collect a sample over, say, 24 hours, if that's the exposure period we're concerned about. So one point here is the concentration of the individual, of the contaminant individual volumes of air is irrelevant. The question is, what is the mean concentration of the contaminant in the entire volume of indoor air circulating through the house at that time? So we can... In this way, we can send a six liter sample to laboratory, Here's this example, and it pretty much directly represents over two million liters a day, or two million liters of air that circulate through that building. What a, a great sample. Testing of soil and sediment. We did this pretty poor job in the past. I always harass myself for this. because I've, I've got a PhD in geology. And I was putting random handfuls of dirt in jars for years, which is pretty silly. This is described in our decision at multi increment sampling methods guidance that I mentioned earlier, our technical guidance manual. Very similar question, does contaminant X in exposed soil pose a direct exposure risk? And again, we're looking at chronic exposure. So what are our data needs? Well, the same thing, essentially. What is the mean concentration of X in surface soil during the specified exposure period? In this case, we can assume nothing's gonna change at this site. So what's our decision unit? Well, it's the entire volume of soil included in this exposure area. So just so one example might be, say your yard of a house and our, our default yard area for residential homes is 500 square meters, 5,000 square feet. If we're looking at the top 15 centimeters or so of soil, then the total volume of soil is about 75 cubic meters. So that's our question is, what's the mean concentration of contaminant X or the true concentration of contaminant X in this 75 cubic meters of soil? Ideally, we dig up all the soil and send it to the laboratory, test as a single sample. That's not realistic. So we have to collect a representative sample. We are not risk waste way to do this. Way to do this would be to collect and individually test, say 10 or more random 100 to 200 gram discrete samples collected from individual points, then calculate a mean. Or in, a lot of times we just use the maximum concentration because the data are highly variable. Don't make much sense. Well, a much better way to do this is risk-based approach would be to collect and test a single one to two kilogram sample from 35, 30 to 75 points or increments throughout the decision. And this is what we do now with soil. The concentration of the contaminant in the individual increment, again, is irrelevant to the question being asked. 
But it's a similar issue for testing sub-slab vapors. And now this is starting getting similar to issues of testing groundwater. And here you can review our guidance for large volume purge sampling methods. Methods again in our technical guidance manual. Similar question again. Just all we did was change the media. Does contaminant X in sub-slab vapors pose a vapor intrusion risk? So our data needs, again, very similar. What is the mean concentration of X in intruding vapors during the specified exposure period? Decision unit is going to be the volume of sub-slab vapors anticip anticipated to intrude the structure during the specified exposure period. So in this case, again, back to our default vo home volume of 244,000 liters, 244 cubic meters. Well, if, if you look at the way buildings and homes operate, and this is reflected in part in EPA's vapor intrusion guidance database, but default vapor entry rate into a single family home like this, when you're looking at, at differences in indoor outdoor air pressure, for cold climates, about five liters per day, or five liters per minute, or this equates to about 7,200 liters per day. We discussed this in a research document I'll mention here in a minute a few years ago. And here's an example of what that would look like. Here's a weather balloon we blew up to, to reflect 7,000 liters of air just for a visual comparison. So a, a not-risk-based not risk approach to collect samples from this would be to collect and test one or a, a few random one liter or even smaller sub-samples of uh, sub-slab samples and then calculate a, a mean based on the data that you get. So again, we're, that doesn't directly answer the question. We don't know the error in that data. So a more risk-based approach would be to collect a single continuous sample of vapors intruding a point during a specified time period. And we refer to this in its large volume per sampling methods. And we have a, it's in our guidance. We published a paper on it, or it's actually it's just in our guidance right now. And again, the concentration of the contaminant in the individual small volume of Vapors under the slab, again, is irrelevant to the question being asked. This is the field setup we did of a field study. So one thing we, we started discovering, and again, just like soil, we always suspected is this hidden heterogeneity between co-located small volume soil vapor samples. This is part of the field study that we did. In this case, we we're only able to install six, these are passive diffusion samplers within just a few feet of each other, just to get a general idea of what the difference, the variability in contaminant masses or concentration would be in very closely spaced samples. So you see here the difference, we we're testing for PC and TC. And in, in this small example, we saw a two to four fold variability between co-located samples. So that makes a difference when you start uh, generating ISO concentration maps and such. And one thing you'll see on such maps is these isolated hot spots and cold spots that are probably just artifacts of small scale heterogeneity don't really represent large scale patterns. Now, when you do with, with soil vapor studies in general, just like with soil in general, some of the large scale map patterns can be reasonably accurate, semi-accurate, sometimes they can. So this study helped us define our the, the problem. Actually, we. So that we published a paper on this with respect to vapor intrusion investigations in 2014, and just demonstrating that very small scale variability in contaminant concentrations and sub-slab vapors can really negate any attempts to, to estimate vapor intrusion attenuation rates within buildings. This really negates EPA's vapor intrusion empirical database, which we have several webinars and published a paper on again. So it's in, instead of just pointing out the problem, we went out and tried to find a solution. And actually, a guy, Todd McCallery, with, in uh, Ontario, Canada, had been doing this for years. We would collect these large volume purge samples and get a much more representative uh, sample of the vapors under a slab to assess potential indoor air risk, vapor intrusion risk. There's a paper that we published on this study. We also have webinars published. So it's, it, this gets, again, starting to relate, think more about groundwater sample data and ISO concentration maps. Discrete samples for sub-slab vapors can really lead to, to a erroneous ISO concentration maps. This is the same dry cleaner site that we investigated for our field study. On the left, there's an ISO concentration map based on nine discrete one liter summa canister samples collected on this lab. 
these first flag that comes up these artificial hot spots and they're just a single hot spot based on a single sample. So that's a flag. We go back to the same site, split the slab up into 25 grid points or grid cells. Within each cell, we installed four passive diffusion samplers, so for a four increment sample. And then we had the laboratory combine those four samples or four passive diffusion samplers into one sample for testing. And then we generated this ISO concentration map. So look at the difference. And this is still shocking to us how our original discrete sample data could be so far off that it completely missed the, the vapor plume under the slab. You know, maybe things had changed in time between these two. Uh, it's probably a, a combination of maybe that and just the error that can be in this small volume of vapor, soil vapor sample. Again, we have a webinar published or posted on this research project. So that throws up, or sort of supports a lot of the red flags we were thinking about for testing groundwater. The surface water, not quite so much, but you can get the same problem. So we, we use this background to start to revise our, our surface water and groundwater investigation section of our technical guidance manual. And the same process applies. We go through the systematic planning steps where we re review the site history, you specifically state your investigation objectives, what are your questions, uh, you designate decision units for sample collection and collect representative samples, and then evaluate the quality of the data. So these steps should be applied to any envir environmental investigation regardless of the media. We didn't incorporate these concepts into our original surface water and groundwater sampling guidance. But that's what we had just done and posted a public review section for, for other people to comment on. So we'll start back at the beginning. So what's the question? The potential environmental concerns associated with contaminant water. Well, first, what do we mean by water? We could be thinking about leachate in the Vado zone groundwater, of course, surface water, or wastewater discharges from industries, although we're not going to really focus on that. It's a very similar question again. Does contamination in leachate, wastewater, surface water, groundwater, whatever, pose a potential leaching, drinking water, aquatic habitat, vapor intrusion risk to human health or the environment? So we always have to establish the question first. Next step is what are the decision units? And we went back and started looking at just some of the, few of the original US EPA and other guidance documents for, for characterization of groundwater. And the same thing we saw for soil. People back then were actually still already thinking about decision units. It's not really a, a new idea, even though some of the consultants we talked to originally about this idea who are very savvy about multi-income sampling and decision units for soil and sediment, thought it was a crazy idea. But it's not really. So 1996, the guidance on low flow sampling, here they're very specifically discussing distributional heterogeneity of contaminants in groundwater. So a sampling plan must take into account the potential scale of changes in site conditions through space. So you're thinking of lateral decision units. You're also thinking about risk-based decision units. The prevailing conceptual ideas included testing of large and relatively homogeneous aquifers. You're there you're just specifically looking at drinking water risk from a large aquifer. You're also thinking about source area to use. There is an awareness that in most cases, the primary concern is characterization of contaminant flow paths or thin layers of contamination rather than entire aquifers. So if the aquifer is contaminated, you want to focus in and try to identify specific source areas that you may be able to, to remediate and clean up. Also, quite a bit of thought about vertical decision units. And this is from 1992 US EPA's document, Era in Groundwater Sampling. Really interesting, pretty short document to read. So they're already talking about capturing heterogeneity. This was great because this is the whole point of large scale or large volume samples in the theory of sampling. So when groundwater contamination is vertically stratified, composite samples, as they're using that term, collected from a long screen well represent some sort of average concentrations. So it's a way to get the mean concentration of a contaminant or the true concentration of a contaminant in a specific, in this case, vertical DU interval of, of water, groundwater. So and here again, they're, they're thinking in terms of risk in one part. When defining human receptors, this may not be an issue. It's very true because you're only looking at risk 
but they're also thinking about source area decisions again, is short intakes or short screens open to a single strata or zone of contamination are more likely to provide samples that represent specific depth intervals. So if you're concerned about remediation, optimizing remediation, you need to look at smaller to use or short, in this case, source area decision units. So they're thinking about decision units. So how do you how do you characterize, how do you collect a sample and collect a representative sample? So first we'll look at surface water, and this is the easiest, not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Get back to the same basic questions we've been we were thinking about for indoor air and subslab vapor and, and soil and, and sediment. So the question, does contaminant X in surface water pose a direct exposure risk? That's what the risk assessment may be asking. So what does a field person need to do for data needs? It's what is the mean concentration in this example we use here of bacteria in the beach swimming areas? Decision unit, volume of water within an area typically used by an individual person. This is a common issue here in Hawaii and long coastal areas. It's a large body of water that people use. Is in Hawaii, especially, is exposure to bacteria in beach areas after heavy rainfall. So a lot of muddy water from the inland coming out into the ocean. So the next step then would be think about decision units. And I, this is Alamoana Park, if anyone's familiar with Honolulu. I used to bike through there all the time. If you go there and just sit and watch, then the decision units pop up. They start to appear, and you start seeing the same people going to the same areas every day. And you can identify specific areas where people sort of congregate the same people or decision units. So you can see here we identified five different areas along the beach. So that there's two different areas. One is the shallow areas, which say where the kids tend, tend to hang out in these deeper areas where people can swim or adults tend to go out into. So we, we designated 10 decision units here. And these, now that we can anticipate that the distributional heterogeneity, to use the sampling theory term of bacteria in these areas, is going to be pretty high because they're they're actually particles in the water. So how would you how would you collect samples from these areas then, our decision unit areas, which again is a separate issue. First you design the find the decision unit, next you collect the sample. A not risk based way to collect samples would be to go out and collect a, a test a few random one liter samples of water from each one of these decision units, and then calculate a, a mean if you happen to get enough samples. More likely just use a maximum because you don't have money to collect lots of samples. But a better way to do this, a risk-based approach to this, would be to collect a single multi-increment sample from throughout the targeted decision unit. They, they actually do this here using something called an Aloha sampler. It's actually really simple. It's just a bottle with two holes drilled in the cap. One hole lets in the water, the other hole lets out the air. And they, one way they do this is you mount a cooler on a surfboard. I know this would be a great job if anybody's interested. And you paddle back and forth across your decision unit, and you gradually push the bottle up and down within that decision unit, and it'll slowly collect a sample of water. So when you collect your final sample of water, then it's representative of a huge volume of, of water within that decision unit, not just one spot. So that's pretty easy to do. Thinking more about drinking water, and we'll move on to groundwater, it starts to get more and more complicated. Here's a pretty easy sample. We're going to characterize drinking water that's already in a water tank. So same question or similar question, does contaminant X in drinking water pose a direct exposure risk? So in a water tank, we can think that the distributional heterogeneity of contaminants can be pretty low. So our data needs, so what is the mean concentration of X in drinking water during the specified exposure period? That's what the field person is tasked to determine. Then the decision unit, that's pretty easy in this case, it's the volume of water in the tank. So right here we need to start thinking about exposure volumes. So in US EPA guidance for drinking water for non-cancer risks or risk to, to children at zero to six years, we assume that they're ingesting or drinking 1,638 liters of water a year or during that, excuse me, during a six year time period or 0.78 liters per day for an adult it equates over 24 years, it equates to 22,638 liters of water consumed over that time period. So you can think of these as our decision volumes in terms of risk. So how would you test the water in this tank? A not risk-based way to do it would be to assume uniformity of water throughout the tank and just collect a single sample out of the taps that are coming out of the, out of the tank. Just enough volume for the laboratory to test. 
yeah, maybe this is okay. Maybe it really is uniform. I know some people would argue about it. You might see some vertical stratification for various reasons. A risk-based approach will be to collect a single sample throughout the entire tank from multiple points, maybe using something like a Kalawasa tube or something. Probably not necessary, I would, I would think, for dissolved phase contaminants in a single phase media. If we're just looking at dissolved phase in water. But that's the way the risk-based versus non-risk-based sample will be collected. It's complicated a little bit. Same question. Now we're looking at characterizing drinking water in bottled water. So this time, let's say this child's 1,638 liter allotment of water that she's going to drink over six years is already in bottles. And maybe we can assume pretty low distributional heterogeneity. Let's just assume it's all from the same source. It's just in different bottles now. So the data needs are exactly the same. What the field person's tasked with, what is the mean concentration of X in drinking water during the specified exposure period? This time, though, the decision unit, instead of a single water tank, it's a collective volume of water in all the bottles. So what's a non-risk-based way to collect samples? Would be to collect and individually test samples from, say, 10 or more individual bottles and estimate a mean. Well, how do you know those 10 bottles are representative of all of them in general without doing replicates? You would never really know your error in your data. You can make some assumptions, but you wouldn't have any data to, to define it. A more risk-based approach, let's say, open up each one of these 1,638 bottles. Again, we're just thinking hypothetically now. And then combine increments of water from each bottle or from multiple bottles and test a single sample. So how many bottles should you test? I don't know. You'd have to carry out some type of field study to determine that. Maybe one is good enough. Maybe you need to test 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 to capture the heterogeneity between the bottle sets. Again, you're just collecting one sample and you're directly addressing the question because they just want one number. What is the mean, the true concentration of the contaminant in all those bottles as a whole? That was in situ. So let's next look at an ex situ characterization of groundwater. So moving on to groundwater, this is where it starts to get complicated. But we'll start off with an easy example, a water well that we're going to pump water out of the well and test. Same question, does contaminant X in drinking water pose a direct exposure risk? Well, what are the data needs? It's the same data needs. That's the field person has the same task. What is the mean concentration of X in drinking water during the specified time exposure period? And the decision unit, again, is the volume of water. It could be, it's how you think about it, consumed during the exposure period, or maybe it's the volume of water extracted from the well over this exposure period, which the duration, which in this case would be six years for a non-cancer risk for a child. For something to be classified as a water production well, it typically needs to produce about 750 liters a day. So that's a lot of water, 750 liters a day times 365 days a year times six years. I didn't bother to calculate that out. That's a large volume of water, but that's the question that the field person in theory needs to ask, answer. It's what's the concentration of the contaminant in that water as a whole, as if we could put it in a huge tank and test this one sample. But that's not going to happen, obviously, but a not risk-based way to to do this would be go up to the well and collect and test a random small volume, say one liter sample from the water every three months. It's not directly addressing the question. You don't really know what the distributional heterogeneity of the contaminant is in the, in the water coming out of that well. We, we assume that it's, it's not that different, but how often have we actually gone out and tested that in detail? A, a better way to do it, something new to think about relating back to our sub-slab vapor samples approach, would be to purge, collect a large volume purge sample every three months. In this case, just as an example, let's purge 1,638 liters of water out of this well. It's not that much. You see the guy up there with the cubic meter box, put it in a pool, and then collect a sample from the pool. And now the samples that we send to the laboratory, these small vials and bottles, represent a large volume of water. So much more risk-based. And I bet if you did this for contaminants, just ignoring issues with VOC loss or something, maybe let's just think about PFAS in general, then the, the mean concentration or the concentration of PFAS in, in a large volume per sample, most of the time it's going to be higher than it is in these single samples because you're missing smaller scale hot areas or hotter areas of contaminants in the plume. There's really no reason to think that dissolved phase contaminants in groundwater are homogenous or uniform at that scale. Something to think about. That was ex situ characterization of groundwater. Let's start moving into reality 
Well, you could do that for drinking water wells pretty easily. But some consultants actually are already doing this. So now we're going to look at in situ characterization of groundwater. Same exact question, does contaminant X in drinking water pose a direct exposure risk? Well, now it's a little more complicated because it's underground. Let's start off with a, a, a simple example to think about. This time it's going to be a, a swimming pool. And we could anticipate low distributional heterogeneity within the swimming pool for now. Otherwise, same thing. Same data needs. What's the mean concentration of, drink, of X in the drinking water during the specified exposure period? Decision unit, same idea. It's the volume of water. In this case, in the swimming pool. A swimming pool, say, think of it as an aquifer. It could be the size of Oklahoma. It could be the size of a swimming pool. And I'm just using the swimming pool as an example. A not risk-based way to collect a sample from the swimming pool would be to assume that it's uniform throughout and just go up to the edge of the pool and dip a cup in and collect a sample. You know, maybe that's okay. Maybe it is uniform throughout in this case. Or maybe not. It probably is. Uh, a more risk-based approach to collecting a sample would be to collect a single sample again, say using something like a Kaliwasa tube and go through the entire pool and collect a single sample or combine it into a single sample and maybe subsample that and send it to the laboratory. So again, this probably isn't necessary for single phase media. It's just water. We're just looking at dissolved phase contaminants. But that's the way a risk-based sample would be collected. Let's complicate this a little bit more. This time, I'm going to fill the swimming pool up with sand. Let's just assume it's totally inert, glass, silica, whatever. I'm not worried about sorption or anything like this. So again, it's very similar. All we did was fill the pool up with sand. Now, say 33 or 40% of the stuff in the pool is water the other most of it is actually sand but in this case we could still assume that the distributional heterogeneity of any contaminants in the water is, is, is pretty low so the data needs again exactly the same what's the mean concentration of x in drinking water in the pool during the specified exposure period cis unit same things the water in the pool uh, it's just a lot of sand in it also so the same issue a not risk-based approach would just be say to put in a single monitoring well and collect a sample. And then you have to make a lot of assumptions that the, the, the groundwater in this pool and other parts of the pool is the same as where you put in the monitoring well. And maybe that's okay, maybe it isn't. In this case, let's assume it is okay because it's inert sand. A more risk-based approach would be, let's say with that same monitoring well, let's go to the monitoring well and this time let's pump out 1,638 liters from that monitoring well into a pool, then collect a subsample of that, put it in jars, send that to the laboratory. Well, that's a much better sample. Is it necessary? Not in this case, I don't think, but that's the way a risk-based sample would be collected. But now that's complicated even more, and this is getting more into reality. Same question. All we did this time is fill the, fill the swimming pool with, with uh, variable layers of dirt. So different, different levels of organic carbon, different amounts of clay in different parts of this. Let's say the soil is, is stratified and such. Same data needs. The field person has the same question they're tasked with. What's the mean concentration of X in the, in the water in this, in this uh, pool during the specified exposure period? And the decision unit again is the volume of water in the pool. That didn't change either. But now you don't know the distributional heterogeneity. If, and we'll look at this again in a minute. We mentioned it before. Is we know we're going to get a differential partitioning of contaminants to soil, to organic carbon and clay in different areas of the pool. We know the con contaminant concentrations to soil can be heterogeneous to some degree. So you have to expect that the concentration of contaminant in the water around that soil at a small scale, the scale of it, say a one liter sample or something, is also going to be variable. So in this case now, assuming uniformity of water throughout the pool may not be that appropriate. And you don't really know the error, error associated with collecting a single discrete sample from a single well within even this small pool area. Just something to, to think about. A more risk-based approach. Now you could try your large volume purge samples, but especially the stuff we look at here, the permeability is so low, that's not going to work. Or you could put in lots of mounting wells or lots of points, say with a hydro punch or probe or something, direct push rig, and collect an MI sample of the groundwater throughout the entire pool. And that's going to give you a, a much more accurate idea of the concentration, the mean concentration of the contaminant in that water, as if you could collect all that water together and put it in a pool and test it. You should get a similar number. 
Well, that's getting complicated. But just hold that thought. So that's a. Now let's look at a dry cleaner test case. So we're moving on to into a reality check. So we we thrown up some red flags about potential concerns about the reliability of data for single monitoring wells in groundwater. Whether or not we can do anything about it, it's a different question. Let's look at a reality check with a dry cleaner. So in this case, there's a former dry cleaner. It's just assume there's a suspected PC release directly under the building. It's already known. So step one, what's the question? So you formulate your investigation questions. That might be, does the concentration of PC and vapors under the slab of the building pose a vapor intrusion risk? Let's say there's a drinking water aquifer directly under this building. So does the concentration of PC in the drinking water aquifer pose a drinking water risk? So pretty straightforward. And, and I think as we go through this, you'll see it's it's really nothing new. We've always been thinking about this. Now we're just presenting it in terms of the theory of sampling or systematic planning. Step two is designate groundwater decision units. And first, let's look at lateral decision units. And again, we've, in reality, we haven't been calling them decision units, but we've been doing this all, all along. So in this case, where the dry cleaner itself was, I've designated this area as a, a source area decision unit, or you could even call it a vapor intrusion risk decision unit right around the building itself. We actually have a default minimum vapor intrusion decision unit area for groundwater in our guidance of 1,000 square feet, 100 square meters. That's just the default size of a small building. So the, the objective is to tell me the mean concentration of PCE in the groundwater within this 100 square meter area under the building or in any area, just to get an initial assessment of vapor intrusion risk. On a side note, we would always collect soil vapor samples on this lab, large volume purge samples in the real site. So you can see here, I, I've surrounded the source area by what we would call perimeter area, a perimeter DUs or boundary area DUs. I've got two rings of those just to try to get an idea of the lateral extent of any contamination here. Same thing we've always been doing, very similar to how we would ideally place monitoring wells around a site like this to figure out how to approximate the size of the plume. So again, nothing different. And the data needs, again, we want to, ideally we want to estimate the mean concentration of the VOC in each DU volume of water now. So that's a difference. Ideally, we want to collect the entire volume of water, send it to laboratory test, or at least collect a representative sample. This is just to get some thoughts going. And the, the, our decision unit it has a lateral and a vertical component that we have to think about. So it's area plus a volume. And the, the whole concept of decision units, uh, people have been thinking about for a long time. Here's a great quote from Aristotle that someone passed along to me. It is the mark of an instructed mind to rest easy with the level of precision that the decision requires and not to try an exactness that is unnecessary for the problem. So decision units, nothing special. Now that the, the vertical resolution of groundwater decision units, people have been thinking about this for a long time too, but we can also put this and think about this more in terms of risk, which again, we've always been doing. So I haven't described it as such. So a, a risk-based decision unit vertically might be one where we're just focusing on a specific aquifer. So we're not really concerned about specific zones within that aquifer, that groundwater production zone. We want to know what the, the mean concentration of the contaminant is for the aquifer in general, as if we're pumping water out of that well. So that's a risk-based approach. A remediation-based decision units. In this case, let's say you know the aquifer is contaminated, you need to treat it, do some remediation. So in this case, you need to start focusing on identifying and focusing on suspect source area decision units within that aquifer. This is where you, you may need to get, or you will need to get more detailed data on where the contamination may actually be coming from and such. This really has to be a, a collective decision between risk assessors and remediation experts. There's a lot you have to think about. You know, are you focusing on groundwater and high permeability formations? So you're just looking at production. Or if you're worried about contamination, you may really want to focus on groundwater and actually even contaminants in the soil and these low permeability formations that are serving as the source. So a lot of thought has to be given into the vertical designation of decision units for groundwater with respect to the question B. So let's think more about decision units now and here's, here's a cross section of the site hypothetical of course for a vapor intrusion risk decision units. And you'll see again really nothing special. I'm just calling them decision units. Maybe we find 
three decision units directly under the building. We want to determine the mean concentration of PC in, in the water within each one of these decision units to address or assess vapor intrusion risk. Let's just assume that we're mostly concerned about the concentration of the PC in the upper half meter of groundwater. It's assumed to be the primary source of vapors to the overlying building. So when we're concerned about something like vapor intrusion risk, when we think about remediation, and while you generally want to designate pretty small sort of combined risk and remediation based decision units to assess vapor intrusion risk. And also I mentioned too, we'd also, in our guidance, we'd always kind of collect, concurrently collect soil vapor samples directly under the slab using our large volume purge approach. So vapor intrusion risk to use, nothing special. Always been thinking about it. About drinking water risk decision units. Again, very similar to what we've always been doing. When you're right in the source area under the building, then you want to designate decision units that are pretty small, pretty closely spaced together, just to assess, both to assess risk and you're anticipating you have to do some remediation here. As you move down gradient in these areas, you're at less concerned about remediation, mostly with monitoring and assessing, assessing risk. So your down gradient decision units are going to be larger than the ones right in the source area. I threw in this example here. I just, just hypothetically say whether the aquifer terminated directly under the building. So if you go over to the right here, it's no longer there. This is often a case, that should I collect a sample to the right of the aquifer here where there's no, there's no decision. The decision is the aquifer. If it's not there, there's nothing to test. Here's another type of decision, it's especially pertinent to a lot of the work we do here in, in Hawaii and in coastal areas where I've worked, is your the concern is discharge of contaminated groundwater into to surface water. If it's petroleum, it might be sheens and such, or just acutely toxic groundwater, either naturally discharged into surface water, or more commonly during construction projects, if the shallow groundwater, they have to put in trenches to put in utilities, and they have to dewater the trenches, pump the water out. A lot of times in the past, they would dump it straight into the storm sewers and go straight out into the ocean. So that's a big concern here. In this case, we may assume, say, the upper five meters of groundwater, or three meters or whatever, is seem to be vulnerable to natural off-site flow or dewatering during future construction. So here's another type of decision it's in that we might designate the site to test and assess the specific question of surface water discharges. Again, very common here in Hawaii. And San Francisco Bay Area, a lot of other areas where I've worked. Then finally, how about remediation-based DU? So you know you have contamination problem, remediation folks come in and they want to focus right where the source is under the building. And they'll set a both a lateral resolution of DUs and also especially a vertical resolution of DUs. So they know how to treat different layers depending on the where the contamination is. And they'll they'll do this to a point to just to optimize the remediation. Where there's no point in further trying to test and characterize smaller and smaller layers because there's no added benefit to the remediation. And then outside decision units that they would also use here, see on either side would be used to monitor the effectiveness of the remediation. So that's DUs, not a, not a new idea after all. But next step then is to characterize the groundwater within these decision units. And that's where it's things start to get a little tricky. We need to think about more. So just starting where we, we would naturally start with soil, we talk a lot about, so you're, if you're concerned about lead and lead contamination in your yard, whether the best way to, to assess the risk would be to dig up your entire yard and send it to the laboratory and have them test it as one sample, get one concentration for lead. Because you're looking at chronic risk, exposure across the entire yard, random exposure over many, many years. So option one would be the same thing, do that with with groundwater, let's assume you can designate these decision units. There's a specific volume of water within there. Ideally, you'd pump that entire volume out and send it to the laboratory to test as a single sample. Option two, since that's probably not going to happen, it would be to collect a multi-increment sample of groundwater the same way we do for soil. Maybe you would just put in you know, monitoring wells or collect increments of, of groundwater from throughout the decision unit. But you know, how many increments should you, should you collect? What volume of water do you need to collect to capture the heterogeneity and, and address sampling error and such? Like the same thing we have to do for soil. Well, that's not really known. This probably isn't feasible in most cases. It'd be an interesting research project. So option three, 
is then we're back to where we are now. Develop alternative method. But you have to start understanding the limitations, potential error of the data that you have. So as alternative to multi-increment sampling of groundwater, maybe we'll be doing that one day, but not right now. Again, it's back to our single increment or single well groundwater samples instead of multi-increment groundwater samples. So we have our same decision units now. In this time, we're just going to install a single well, like what we'd be doing. And now this suddenly looks very familiar. So it's really nothing, nothing new. But we know now that our our samples are going to have some error, unknown error with them with respect to representing the decision unit or even the immediately surrounding area. So this approach, now we understand it assumes insignificant small scale random distribution or heterogeneity of dissolved phase contaminants in groundwater. So it, a bit more simply, if I move the well over five feet or five meters or something, how different is that number going to be? And is it going to be random, which I bet it would be in a lot of cases, or, do you, or are you going to see a trend that gradually increases toward the next well, as we like to assume? our ISA concentration maps in general, chances are in reality, it's going to be a lot more variable and more random, the same thing as we see in soil. So up and down, up and down. So the large scale trends might be accurate, but these small scale trends between individual points can be totally random. So the, the question then is how do we collect a representative sample of the entire DU interval thickness? We can't get the DU, at least the entire volume of groundwater there, let's at least try to get a representative sample of this targeted interval of groundwater that's now in this, that's represented by the well. So how do we do that? And then we still have to think more about what the representative, these representative, these small volume samples we send to the laboratory is, especially considering that the, the amount of water just around a well itself is probably in the tens of thousands of liters. And we're going to try to represent that with a 40 milliliter vial. So these, these slides, same thing we showed before, now I'll just have a single well popped in the middle of each one of these decision units here, kind of representing the area around Honolulu and such. The, the shallow soil tends to be very silty, sandy, clay, low permeability. You're not going to collect a large volume purge groundwater sample from this stuff. It's like trying to suck water out of toothpaste. So you're, we're stuck with what we've been doing now with these small volume samples. So we have to be real specific. One thing, though, to think about is when you're installing screens now and to test groundwater, the screen should reflect risk, not just the, the length of the screen that happens to be supplied by the manufacturer, like five feet or something. Just think about that in more detail, which we have been in the past, but this gives us more motivation to do it. And then, But next, we want to collect a standard, I would call it a small volume, a single increment sample, whatever, that's representative of the entire DU column, uh, interval water column. In that surrounding formation. So here I'm just putting in the wells. We look at sample, collecting the samples here again in a minute. Same thing for assessing drinking water risk. So we have a more permeable drinking water aquifer. You've got our wells put in there. I would say recommend in this case, again, I'm not thinking about VOC loss or how to dispose of the water, just thinking kind of ideally. But instead of collecting these small volume samples, then it, try to collect a large volume purge sample that's purged. 1,000, 2,000 liters of water out of each one of the wells and then collect a sample from that. How do you minimize VOC loss? I don't know. Maybe that's, we like to say from a cubicle standpoint, well, that's just an engineering issue. We'll let them work it out. Somebody will, I'm sure. And what do you do with the, all this water that you now have collected? You're not going to send to the lab. You re-inject it on site, send it to a wastewater treatment plant. Those just details we have to think about. The main goal working out here is how do you get representative data back to the person assessing risk or doing remediation. That's the main point. Assessing discharge to surface water, same thing. I have the wells in this low permeable formation again. In this case, we want to get a representative sample. I'm saying of the upper five meters of groundwater in each one of these wells. Again, very common issue. Remedial actions, optimizing that. Similar idea, you might put in nested wells. So again, this looks pretty familiar what we always been doing. Now we just are talking more in terms of risk, optimizing remedial actions and decision units. So in some of these wells, some of the units, you might be able to get some good large volume purge samples. In other cases, you may be stuck with getting the small volume samples or just traditional wells. 
So it's thinking now about what kind of error might be in these samples, just to throw out some ideas, and I don't know. We really need to do some detailed field studies. The thing is, here in Hawaii, better or worse, we don't have a lot of big groundwater contamination sites that we could do research on. The only one we had, they just put a huge building on it, and we can't get to the groundwater anymore. Maybe we can do that at some point. But some potential sources of small-scale heterogeneating groundwater, just to think about, is first is heterogeneity of the soil matrix, which again we talked about before with respect to organic carbon and clay content can vary quite a bit laterally and vertically. So this is bound to be reflected in heterogeneity in the groundwater itself. And again, you know, vertical heterogeneity of, of strata with different layers of sand, silt, clay, or even bedrock and such. And we have to think about variability of permeability within the same unit. When I used to work with the California EPA Regional Water Board in San Francisco Bay Area. We had a lot of these sand units, TC plumes moving into them. And you, the, the plumes would just appear and disappear and appear and disappear in the monitoring wells. And I bet that what was happening is that the groundwater is moving through, through uh, relic channels in the sand or of streams that were flowing through this sandbar, say along a beach or something. And that's where the plume is moving. So it's much like a braided river. So you get a lot of anastomosing plumes. That's why you're monitoring well data don't seem to make sense. Of course, you can make sense out of it, but it may not be real if you just collect a few, put in a few monitoring wells. <clears throat> so that can be make it a lot difficult to track. Also, pulses of release over time versus steady release. Again, some sites I looked at when I was working in the San Francisco Bay Area with a specific monitoring wells, it looked like we could see hot spots, hot volumes of groundwater, pretty small pass-through monitoring wells. So the concentration would start to go up and the concentration would go back down in just a one-time event. So it's probably, in this case, it was tied to someone doing, uh, they were using hexavalent chromium to chrome-plated wheels up gradient. And they weren't dumping this continuously into the water. They were probably just dumping it out once a month or once a year or something like that. So you get these little spots, contamination moving down, then it go down, concentration go up and down. So it looks a lot like moldy bread is somebody who looks at degradation of petroleum contamination in the subsurface head. You don't really see smooth plumes. It's, it's spotted. So how do you, to, in order to collect a representative sample then, first thing in this case, you need to capture the, red, the vertical heterogeneity within this targeted DU interval. And that's gonna be controlled the way you would do this by your well design, how you collect the sample, and even perhaps the, the volume of sample that you collect. You also need to assess the lateral reproducibility of data for a single well, <clears throat> which we've never done. But we've always thought about the same thing for discrete soil samples. If I move my sample over a, a foot or two, am I going to get the same number? So it, especially in this case, you, you could put in co-located wells, replicate wells, not true replicates, say around X percent, 10 percent or whatever the monitoring wells and anticipated high variability areas. Just some ideas. So when to worry, when not not to worry. So this had us, got us back to thinking about what we see in, in contaminated soil. And it's sites where we have lots and lots of discrete soil samples, which we actually would use sometimes to initially screen an area, say with a field XRF in this case. This is an arsenic contaminated site here in Hawaii, nine acres. And we start looking at this, we see this at all the sites we work on, or a lot of most of the sites. We see three specific zones, maybe some of them are missing, but Zone A, we see here is heavy contamination. So any small pinch of soil from this area is going to have super high arsenic concentrations in it, and they're all going to be above our screening level. So it's kind of a can't miss area. Zone C is the opposite, where we're totally out of contamination. Any specific pinch or even discrete sample of soil collected in this area is going to be well below our action level. So again, it's can't miss. There's no contamination there. This is zone in between, this zone B, where at any given, for any given discrete sample, the concentration of arsenic or the contaminant could be above or below if you move over a foot or two or even test within the same sample jar. That's where you start to get these artificial hot spots and cold spots popping up on maps. And that's really the, the big problem we see with soil contamination and getting reliable data. So a more realistic data resolution for this ISA concentration map, in this case for soil, we're going to see the same thing in groundwater, is just these three zones, A, can't miss, all above, C, kind of can't miss, it's all below, but then this B, where you get a high risk of false negatives, and I would say also false positives. 
because we're always interested in the mean, not the individual points. We started looking at some groundwater maps. Not that many around. We got a lot of samples. We see the same thing. On the left here is arsenic in soil, project done by the USGS, published 2014. 4,000 discrete samples collected across the U.S. These were good discretes collected over one square meter area, nine points, ground really well. But still, look at all the hot spots and cold spots. If you see them, the hot spots show up better that pop up on this map. And a lot of these are based on just a two meter sample, two or one meter square sample of soil. And if you see the square with the arrow pointing to it, I know that spot because we talk about this in the, another webinar I gave. My sister lives right there. So that single hot spot, if you zoom in on it, it represents an area of over 2,000 square kilometers. But that spot is based on a single sample collected from a one square meter area. So it's it's totally artificial hot spot. And I know the geology of this area well. It's a lot of, of, a, of a mineralized veins and things popping through here. It just happened to land on one. So these are artificial hot spots. Large scale patterns are real, small scale patterns, hot spots, cold spots aren't. Again, you see these three areas, A, B, C. A and C, you know it's either well above or well below, but it's this B area you really have to worry about. Here's a sample of nitrates in groundwater that I happen to find. 100, I think there are about 200 individual well points and see the exact same pattern. Here, let's just look at the orange and red. You see the large scale pattern is probably real. You see some green down here, but when you get in the yellow area here, you start to see hot, these cold spots and hot spots all through it. This is probably where the concentration of nitrates in the groundwater in any random spot, any random well, is above or below whatever action level they were using. So a well just not too far away might be okay. So that's that's where the ISO concentration maps, the resolution is really way overdone, unrealistic. Now within these areas, if someone knows the you know, the hydrogeology or whatever within these areas, maybe it is a, maybe these hot spots are true. Maybe it's a valley and a small aquifer. You see the scales, 20 kilometers. But at a large scale, they'd be highly dubious. So a more realistic resolution would be this map down here. We see the zone Bs where we have to be really careful. One point that came up in the presentation that I gave actually to EPA was about statistical we're required to do all these statistical tests of, of our groundwater data, especially for drinking water. One lesson we learned in testing soil is that when you have a very high variability in spatial or temporal data or soil data or data in general, that usually reflects a poor sampling method. So we see that you're looking at correlations, say for direct exposure of contaminants in soil to kids or vapor intrusion into buildings. Then Let's say you have lots of different houses and you collect a sample of indoor air, which of course they do really well, and a single sample of soil vapor, one liter under the slab, and you're trying to look at attenuation factors, then your data are highly variable. So you can start playing around and playing games with statistics, trying to make sense of the data, but move the sample point over a few feet and you can get a completely different sub-slab vapor number. So that the database itself is erroneous and all the statistics are just masking that. It's not a problem with the statistical test, it's a problem with the samples. It's the paper we published in 2014 on why EPA's vapor intrusion empirical database is, is unusable. We have another presentation, another webinar on that, in our webinar webpage. Same thing we'd see in groundwater or in water in general, these trends, when you start seeing really erratic trends and you're trying to make sense of it, well, that's, that's probably because you're, you're not collecting samples properly. You're not collecting samples in a way that reflect the question being asked. And the bottom line is they're just too small. Whether you're looking at contaminants in an aquifer and you're only testing 40 milliliters of aquifer at a time, or bacteria in swimming areas, and you're only collecting discrete samples there. So it's a simple problem. And it may be a difficult solution depending on what you're dealing with, but discrete soil vapor, water samples, whatever, the way we've been doing it in the past, are too small to overcome random small scale distributional heterogeneity within some targeted risk-based volume of media. So it's like getting on the back of an elephant. It's one of Gary Larson's cartoons that I stole and claiming it's a bird because you're up too close. So step back, you need a bigger sample to make a decision on. And again, this discrete sample data, same thing for soil, it's, it's for groundwater. The data you get back from the laboratory if your groundwater only represents what you put in the jar because you weren't collecting the sample in a risk-based way. 
versus the exposure volume we're really concerned about. How do you reduce error in our samples in these single increment or single monitoring wells? Let's look back at how we do it for soil. And sometimes we have to use single borehole soil decision units we discuss in our guidance, in section three and four. If we have to get, we want to get data for whatever reason from a single borehole, how can we at least get good data for that one point? And the way to do this is, is pretty simple, is you want to collect a sample representative of the entire targeted decision unit layer. You're not, you don't want to collect discrete every five feet. And I've seen some huge disasters caused by that. So you put in some initial boreholes, define your the core intervals, the layers you're specifically concerned in, and then send that entire core interval, that DU layer, to the laboratory for processing. If it's too big, then you carefully subsample it in the field. We discuss this in detail in our training workshops or training webinars for soil and sediment sampling. This data you get, it's really only good for presence or absence absence of contaminants you know, from mapping large scale patterns and hope that you're not in that zone V area and get really fooled. You can tell when the contaminants are very high or very low. But there's again there's a risk of false negatives and false positives if you're in this funky zone V contamination area. It's a start. We can do something similar for groundwater just to at least improve our single increment groundwater data. Again, it depends on what questions is being asked. But with groundwater, it's a little more complicated. You have to juggle a lot of different biases that you're trying to control. You know, first, ideally, you want to cover the entire targeted DU interval. But you have to think about purging versus non-purging when you're collecting samples, loss of contaminants during sample collection, depending on what tool or method you're using. Then there's all these other ones not necessarily related to sample collection. These other biases that have to be taken into account. So I don't know the answers to these. Just throwing out. Is bringing up the issues for us for us to think about. And there's you know the different types of collection collection methods. The more we looked at it and thought about it, the passive diffusion bags look really good. If we're trying to represent an entire interval, you know, the whole purge non-purge issue comes into place. But what if you can make these manufacturing specific to the, the the length of the thickness of your groundwater DU interval? That would be great. One of the problems with PDB bags in the past is people weren't thinking in terms of risk remediation and if you look back at some of the early studies even in the 90s with PDB bags they they fell trapped to the idea of looking for the maximum concentrations they kept making the bag smaller and smaller and smaller and of course the concentrations get more and more variable and you get higher and higher until you're trying to test water in like a, a two inch thick sand zone that's got ppm level pc which may be completely irrelevant to the question you're asking so it's not addressing risk or remediation so it's something you have to think about What's your DU? What's your question? Same thing with hydro sleeves. They look really good if you can operate them correctly in the field. I don't do a lot of groundwater sampling. So this gets back to the people who do that in the field. Balers, I've always liked balers, but that, they start to look well because you're collecting the entire column. Of course, there are issues with disturbing the water with VOCs. That's probably overblown in my experience. Snap samplers, these type of tools. In this case, you're, you're collecting subsamples of that water column. So maybe not as good as collecting the entire column, but this is also a good way to collect, to, to get good coverage of your target DU interval. And then we have these low flow samplers or low flow sampling methods, right? small volume purge, we're gonna call it. And these, now they start to really come into question because here, if you read some of the original guidance, that there's, there's definitely a focus on trying to find a maximum concentration in the well and also minimize the amount of waste that you get out. So we're back to that same trap we saw in soil, soil sampling of focusing on the wrong thing. We don't, we're not really concerned about maximum concentration in groundwater. At some point, it's probably a million parts per million if we can test down to the molecule level. We look at risk and optimization. And we're, we may not be getting good coverage of the targeted DU interval. I want to consult here. He understands the concept of DUs. He just, he likes the low flow samplers. He'll pull them very slowly up to the water column and he thinks he can get a pretty good representative sample of some targeted interval. That's one thing. Then we have these large volume purge samples we talked about before. Good idea. I think they'd be work well for water wells, but they're going to be biased. The sample is because water is flowing into the, the well. It's going to be necessarily biased to the more permeable units. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe it isn't. And then you have to deal with all the other issues related to it. Just throwing out some examples. I think it's my last slide. Some single well collection methods, ranking, and take these rankings for the Kind of a grain of salt. I just put these in to get some ideas going. And they, these 
column type samplers that I would call them, the PDB bags, hydro sleeves, balers, snap samplers and such. I like that first idea. My first objective is to cover my DU, represent the entire DU. And then you try to address these other issues as far as how easy it is to use if you're using VSCs. That's the next step. Low flow samplers, hmm. good idea. You know, they, they really reduce the waste and such that you generate, but you don't want to over focus on trying to get high concentrations. You need to represent your entire DU coverage. So get away from the idea of looking for maximum concentrations. LVP samples for groundwater. I like it. I think it'd be good for, I would be doing this for drinking water on a regular basis if it's a high permeability unit. And then just dump the water on the ground or something if it's already drinking water, not contaminated. Just some ideas. That's it to summarize the systematic planning and revising our section six of our guidance manual for surface water, groundwater, and not, this, not as difficult as we thought. So step one, identify primary contaminants of concern. Formulate your investigation questions. You always have to start there. Don't run off looking for maximum concentrations and such. Designate lateral and vertical decision units based on risk or optimization, optimization or remediation, which in reality we've been doing all the time in the past. We just, now we're actually trying to draw lines on a map or think about it in more detail. And then it's, you know, we're stuck. We're not gonna collect multi increment samples a lot of, probably any time right now. So you can install one or more monitoring wells in each DU for now. And, and then, but in this case, you would really want to make sure that they're screened properly to address the question being asked and that you can collect some type of sample from that well that's as represented as possible. At least represent the entire column when you can, collecting larger volume purge type sample. And there's other issues you have to deal with, obviously. Well, the engineers work that out. The column type samplers, otherwise, that collect the entire DU interval are a good place to start. Low flow, you need to be careful how we use those. Also, in some of these, around some of these wells, when you're in the zone B area, where you could have high variability between monitoring wells pretty close to each other within the groundwater DU in general, above and below screening levels, we really need to start putting in some replicate wells. You just put in three wells or something around a single well or a couple of wells. No, just not all of them, but just a few of them to start getting an idea of what kind of error we might be seeing in our data. And that's the main point, this whole presentation, this whole discussion, is to start thinking about error. How much error do we have? Potential issues and the limitations of the data. We start making decision units. Questions. So that's it. There are a lot of questions at the end of the webinar. is really good, really fun discussion with the people at EPA headquarters. It's a groundwater. I think we've gone from where we thought we knew everything. And now we, we always knew there was more to this than we thought. And now maybe we're, now maybe we're at a point I'm never going to understand this, but I think we are it's starting to make sense and what the next steps are. I'll let the field people work that out. But from the risk and remediation standpoint, folks, they also need to be involved. And again, we're back to the same question. So that was it. One issue that came up in the, in the presentation to EPA, but it's really interesting. The same questions came up with the groundwater folks as they initially did with the soil folks. And we started talking about MI samples for soil and error and discrete soil sample data. And one question that always comes up is, well, what about acute risk in my backyard? That's why I want to collect discrete samples so I can see if there's any, uh, if there's an acute uh, an area of soil uh, acutely contaminated with with lead or something like that. And we demonstrated that it's impossible to test. If you think how much soil is in your backyard, and if you think a, a pica child or a child might eat a spoonful of dirt at a time, so is there any single spoonful of soil in my backyard that might be contaminated so much with lead that it's acutely toxic to my child? Well, good luck finding that. You'll never be 100% certain. But there's a that's a totally different sampling approach and the same idea applies to to testing water to drinking water groundwater whatever so the the risk assessor question to the field sampler here might be does does the concentration of x in any given du volume of water y within the subject drinking water aquifer exceed z concentration see some hypothetical acute toxicity where well, the first step there's our question what's the next step what's my decision it so you have to think about decision it because samples always a sample always represents a decision it. So what do you want to what do you want what are you asking the field person to do, the risk assessor? And the fun thing on with my job is I'm a risk assessor and a, I do field work also, so I'm constantly arguing with myself. So what's my DU in case of acute risk for drinking water? Is it a single sip, say 25 milliliters? 
So you want me to tell you if there's any 25 milliliter volume of water in this entire aquifer that exceeds this concentration of, of PFAS or something like that? Well, good luck doing that. I can, I can do it if you give me some money with some level of confidence. Or maybe my DU volume is a glass. Drink a glass of water. That might be acutely toxic. But let's pump it up to how much a child is assumed to ingest or drink in a day, 0.78 liters of water. Maybe that's my DU volume. How about over 14 days, ATSDR defines acute toxicity effects that could take place between instantaneously to up to 14 days of continuous exposure. It's now up to 10 liters. So at least I'm not doing 25 milliliters. Now the risk assessor is asking me to tell them if there's any 10 liter volume of water within this aquifer that exceeds some hypothetical acute toxicity number. number. Well, the way you do this, if you want to do it, then risk assessor me, give me the money, me the field sampler, and I'll go try to do it. Step two, then it, in here is you have to define your level of confidence because you're not going to be able to test every DU volume of water in the aquifer. So in this case, let's just say we're going to, we want a 95% confidence that 95% of the DU volumes of water in the aquifer as a whole do not exceed acute screening levels. There's a whole field of sampling statistics behind this, which is, I don't do much myself. It's in, actually discussed in our guidance for large ag fields and such. But, uh, but once you've done that, you just you define your level of confidence. And step three is you test a corresponding number of samples. And this is all worked out mathematically for this 95% confidence that 95% of DU volumes in water or don't exceed some acute screening level. You have to collect 59 samples. And when you collect the samples, the DU volume has, the sample volume has to match the DU volume. So I'll go and I'll collect 59 random, let's just say, uh, 10 liter volumes of water from this aquifer. And collect it in a systematic random way throughout the entire aquifer. And I can tell you with 95% confidence that 95% of the DU volumes of water in the aquifer as a whole don't exceed the maximum concentration that I got in any one of those 59. Well, that's not practical. It's just never going to happen. So the whole idea of maximum contaminant levels in drinking water you know, you know, for acute toxicity. It's a nice idea, but you'll never be able to test a system where no one's ever going to do that with any level of confidence or no one does it now that I know of. So if it's a real concern, same thing with that acutely toxic patch of lead contaminated soil in your backyard, then you just don't use the water. So that was it. Just some my ideas to think about. See my email addresses on the front of the first slide. And as always, we're happy to hear from other people and just start brainstorming about better ideas. And our guidance at the time of this uh, presentation is still posted for a public comment. We probably won't revise it until early next year in 2022. And even after that, we want to have continual comments. Thanks.